Welcome to our first event of the 2020 calendar year. Uh, Happy New Year, everyone, and thanks for coming on a very rainy day uh, to be with us and to listen to Omar Shaker. I've uh, been wanting Omar to speak here for a long time, and uh, he had spoken at uh, Columbia at the Center for Palestine Studies in February of last year. And I last saw Omar in November on the Friday before the Monday that uh, he was leaving forcibly, basically, um, from Israel. Um, so it's great to have you here. And if you don't mind, I'll embarrass you also by saying that uh, Omar is joined by his fiance as of last Thursday, uh, Sarah Kayali, putting you on the spot. But congratulations again. Um, and, um, and anyway, it's great to have you here. Um, Omar has been in the headlines quite a bit. Many of you who have followed uh, international press and uh, maybe less so the regional press. And I've seen much more coverage in the international press than uh, regionally about his deportation um, from Israel, where he has served as the Israel Palestine Director for Human Rights Watch, a position he continues to hold working out of Amman um, in the meantime. And as I mentioned, when I saw Omar um, the Friday before he left on that Monday, uh, I know that Ken Roth, the uh, uh, head or the executive director of Human Rights Watch worldwide, uh, came uh, to escort Omar out of Ben Gurion Airport on that Monday of November 25th um, to. Uh, show support and to make a statement underscoring that despite Israel's claims that this was, his deportation was only about Omar and less about Human Rights Watch, I think Ken's appearance um, really made it uh, underscore the point that this was about Muslim Human Rights Watch as an organization, that it's not really about one and not the other. Um, and I know that many of our um, common friends, uh, human rights activists from Hagai al Ad to Avner and Mickey and everybody I talked to uh, while I was in Israel, Palestine, um, said that they were going to be at the airport on that Monday to see you off. Uh, Omar's experience is really emblematic of an emerging trend uh, in the Israeli government's campaign against advocates for Palestinian rights and of greater equality. Uh, following the passage of a new border entry law that I think was adopted by the Knesset on March 6, 2017. Uh, the Israeli government has turned its sights against those who make a public call for boycotting Israel uh, or boycotting Israeli settlements in the West Bank. And that entry law has given uh, immigration officers a lot of latitude in denying entry um, into Israel. Uh, of people who are considered to be uh, highly critical of Israel, and it has also been used to deport people, as in the case of Omar. Um, just this past year, we had a couple of high-profile cases, one of them including one of our own, uh, my good friend and colleague Catherine Franke, who is a professor of law at Columbia, who was detained for 14 hours at Ben Gurion Airport um, and deported after she was accused of promoting uh, the BDS movement, and she was sent back to New York. Then, of course, we, many of us are familiar with the case of the Palestinian-American student, Lara Al-Qasim, who had a student visa to um, attend Hebrew University in Jerusalem to pursue a master's degree program in human rights, I believe. And um, she was uh, detained at the airport, and then she was held uh, for about two weeks while her uh, uh, case was uh, taken to court, and ultimately the Israeli government did allow her to stay and uh, pursue her, um, her degree. Um, and uh, this was because of her work while she was a student in Florida um, as part of the Students for Justice in Palestine uh, group. Um, it, it, political figures have been denied entry. Uh, you all know about the Omar, uh, Ilhan Omar and the Rashida Tlaib case, uh, two congresswomen uh, who were not given uh, permission to visit um, Israel and the West Bank. This trend is running parallel to a broader international effort to muzzle criticism of Israel and Israeli policy. The, uh, there are plans underway under the new conservative UK government to pass anti-BDS anti legislation. 
uh, in the United States, there are 27 states that restrict boycotting of Israeli goods. And of course, we're all familiar with the executive order signed by Donald Trump last month uh, that effectively categorizes American Jews as a nationality so that they fall under the protection clause uh, for anti-discrimination, uh, in particular on college campuses. Now, this has been incredibly controversial, and not the least by many American Jews who do not want their Jewishness to be defined by Israel, or for their Jewishness to be defined by the Trump administration in particular. Uh, so uh, this is very early on. We expect that this will be legally challenged. I know that ACLU is working on that. Um, and it should be noted that this is pushed at least partially by, of course, Trump's uh, entourage of uh, Jared, Jared Kushner wrote a piece in the New York Times that appeared a couple of days after the executive order was signed, um, um, you know, speaking of how great and how necessary that executive order was. Um, Ken Marcus, who is the head of education, the Education Department's Office for Civil Rights, uh, appointed by Trump and Betty DeVos, uh, has been very, very active on trying to muzzle criticism of Israel on college campuses. And then there are, of course, the informal and ostensibly grassroots efforts like the Canary Mission, uh, a website which hosts dossiers of pro-Palestinian activists and students at North American university campuses in an effort to damage their reputations and their employment prospects. Uh, so Canary Mission has become sort of a resource um, that is used in, uh, by potential employers. Uh, Rashid Khalidi, who spoke here last month, uh, spoke about some of these trends uh, to all of you. Now, despite the significance of Omar's deportation, uh, deportation, it's important to keep the substance of his work in focus over here. So we will come back and talk to, about the deportation perhaps later on in our conversation. Uh, but I want to really focus on the work that Omar has been doing with Human Rights Watch uh, in Israel-Palestine. Um, the work that you've done, Omar, of course, has provided you with unique insight into one of the world's most complex human rights environments. And we will also have an opportunity to discuss not only the myriad of injustices and humiliations resulting from the prolonged Israeli occupation, but also human rights violations at the hands of Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. Um, toward their Palestinian people. Um, by way of a more formal introduction of Omar, uh, let me um, say that he has, among other things, been responsible for investigating human rights violations in the West Bank, uh, Gaza, and Israel, as I mentioned, through his work with Human Rights Watch. But prior to his current role, he was a Bertha Fellow at the Center for Constitutional Rights where he focused on U.S. counterterrorism policies, including legal representation of Guantanamo Bay um, detainees. Uh, he was the 2013 and 14 Arthur R. and Barbara D. Finberg Fellow at Human Rights Watch, and during that period, he investigated human rights violations in Egypt, including the August 2013 Rabah massacre, which killed an estimated 817 protesters in a single day. Omar holds a JD um, from Stanford Law School. Uh, while he was at Stanford, he co-authored a report on the civilian consequences of U.S. drone strikes in Pakistan as a part of the International Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Clinic. He holds an MA in Arab Studies from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and a BA in International Relations from Stanford University. Omar, we're delighted to have you here. Please join me on the stage for a conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. You wanna, yeah, anywhere. Okay. Okay, and uh, as is customary in these uh, kinds of uh, you know, panel discussions, conversations that we have here, uh, Omar and I will talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll open it up uh, for Q&A uh, and engagement with members of the audience. Uh, Omar, welcome again. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And uh, I thought, you know, for the benefit of uh, uh, everyone, maybe you can talk and provide a context about the work that you do. So tell us about Human Rights Watch 
uh, about its mission and the role that you played with Human Rights Watch in Israel-Palestine. Great. Thank you again, Professor Safwan, for having me. And thank you all for coming and braving the uh, cold Amman winter. Um, Human Rights Watch, as I think probably all in this room are familiar, is an international human rights organization. We cover human rights abuses in nearly 100 countries across the world, including every country in the Middle East and North Africa. Our primary mandate is to ensure protection of human rights based on international human rights and humanitarian law. So we document rights abuse committed by a range of government and non-government actors, and we advocate for greater protections of human rights uh, around the globe. Uh, in my current role as the Israel and Palestine director, I oversee the human rights situation in Israel and Palestine. So that includes rights abuses by the Israeli government, as you said in your introduction, as well as those by Palestinian actors, the Palestinian Authority, as well as non-state um, armed groups uh, in the territory. We've been covering Israel and Palestine for nearly three decades. And during that time, we've worked on a range uh, of different issues that pertain to abuses by all these parties. Um, and uh, I think that's a short summary. Few okay. watch. Great, thank yeah. you. Thank uh, you. Omar, you published this report just a couple of weeks ago, right? Um, it's Human Rights Watch report, Born Without Civil Rights, Israel's Use of Draconian Military Orders to Repress Palestinians in the West Bank. And uh, the report discusses uh, Israeli criminalization of nonviolent political activities um, in the West Bank. Um, so those nonviolent political activities could include protesting, publishing material that has any kind of political significance, so to speak, and joining groups that are considered hostile to Israel. And in the report, you argue that uh, you call on Israel, right, um, interpret, you know, in, in terms of its occupation, um, to grant full rights for Palestinians in the West Bank using as a benchmark the rights of Israelis living in Israel. And you and I had a brief conversation about sort of the uh, legal framework in which you argue, um, you know, the, the law of occupation and how it should be applied. Um, tell us more yeah. about this report and about what you uncovered in it and particularly the argument for granting Palestinians under occupation equal rights, you know, the basis for that argument, and where do you see that going? Sure. So Israel's in its 53rd year occupying uh, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. Um, the law of occupation is the bedrock principle we all use to evaluate Israel's conduct in the occupied territories. Now, the law of occupation contains an obligation that the occupier must provide for the public life of the occupied population. Now, this obligation increases in the context of a prolonged occupation. If you're occupying a place for a few months, a few years, you're, you are allowed, in some cases, to restrict rights in the name of security. Logically, if you're there for six months, two years, you might not be able to provide the occupied population with for example, gradual realization of their socioeconomic rights or full civil rights. But Human Rights Watch has found universally that in a prolonged occupation, that obligation increases. So that brings us to Israel-Palestine. How do we apply this framework to Israel-Palestine? Well, the ICRC, the International Committee for the Red Cross, has said that the occupation of, of, of the West Bank and Gaza is the longest sustained military occupation in modern history. Now, Israel, when it occupied the West Bank in 1967, passed a series of draconian military orders. Let me give you a couple examples of these military orders. These orders imposed a 10-year jail sentence on anybody who influences public opinion if it could harm public safety or public order. 10 years for publishing material having a political significance if it didn't have army approval. 10 years for a political convening, um, you know, gathering for political purpose as more than 10 people without wow. army approval. Wow. And 53 years later, Israel continues to use these military orders to restrict the ability of Palestinians to speak out, 
report the news, um, organize peaceful protest, etc. So what we did in our research is for the last five years, we looked at the indictments that were used by the Israeli army against Palestinian activists, journalists, and ordinary people who were critical on social media. And we found that they were primarily citing three military orders and using these military orders um, in order to restrict Palestinian civil rights. Now, it might strike you as surprising, but under the law of occupation, there is no really such thing as civil rights, you know, or equal rights. There is nothing under the law of occupation that says that a settler in Hebron and a Palestinian should be given the same rights. One, because settlements are war crimes, so the settler shouldn't be there. But secondly, you know, there was the law of occupation does not explicitly deal with the situation of prolonged occupation. So what the and it's a military occupation, so it does not deal with civil issues. Exactly. Such, yeah. Exactly. So what our report essentially lays out is it, our conclusion after many years of documenting abuses in the West Bank is simply to say that Israel cannot continue to justify its decade-long suspension of civil rights in the name of security or occupation. That argument today is invalid. And when looking at what rights a Palestinian today should have in the occupied territories, the baseline should be what Israel provides its own citizens. So what, what does that mean in practice? When it comes to civil rights, there are two, in addition to the 2.5 million Palestinians living in the West Bank, you have over 400,000 Israeli settlers, putting East Jerusalem to a side. These settlers are governed under Israeli civil law, have full protection of their civil rights, which means they can protest freely, they have and pretty much free access, associate can... expression. Meanwhile, Israel has banned 411 Palestinian organizations. Every major Palestinian political party is outlawed, including the Palestine Liberation Organization, in addition to the detention of journalists, the detention of ordinary activists. So essentially what we're saying is, and, uh, and you can move beyond civil rights, so socioeconomic rights. Today, Israel provides in Sidorot, an Israeli town one kilometer from Gaza, 24 hours of electricity. Meanwhile, in Gaza, it provides, depending on the day, anywhere between 4 to 12 hours of electricity. What we're saying is when, dis when deciphering what Israel's obligation is towards Palestinians, the baseline is what you provide your own citizen. Because right. if people in Sidorot have 24 hours of electricity and you control Sidorot and Gaza, you should, at minimum, provide the people of Gaza 24 hours of electricity. Now, do you use the framework of the settlements? Yani, do you t yeah. Again, settlers get the same rights as people yeah. who live in Rehovot or in Haifa yeah. or in anywhere. Uh, but are you using, you know, as your sort of benchmark for comparison, the settlements themselves or Israel more broadly? No, not settlements, because settlements are a war crime Illegal. and they shouldn't exactly. be there. So yeah. the baseline is what Israel gives its own citizens. And right. just to be fully clear here, we're not saying the answer is equality, you know, one state necessarily, right? What we're based saying is Israel today, there's a one state reality and it's a one state reality built on systematic discrimination and unequal rights. So, so long as Israel remains in effective control, it must provide Palestinians at least the same rights it provides its own citizens. Right. That's not to say that it can address this issue just by you know, um, equal rights. It could address it in any sort of political arrangement. But the idea is for too long the international community has said, you know, if not two states, if not peace, you know, then uh, you know, apartheid or some other term. But what we're basically saying is we're not going to wait to some hypothetical right. day down the road. We're talking about today's reality. And Israel can't keep saying that we're not going to give Palestinians their rights in the name of a mythical peace process, which we've seen has led to no change on the ground. And the narrative has shifted. I mean, internationally and within the Palestinian uh, communities, um, you know, towards rights and away from geography, right? So the discourse has become far more focused on rights. You know, forget one state, two state, geographies, borders. You know, I want my civil rights, I want my socioeconomic rights. And this really fits within that narrative. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. And also, 
Did you deal with Gaza differently than you did with the West Bank? Because, yeah. you know, the argument, you know, one is a military occupation, one is <laughs> an entity that is supposedly um, uh, independent when in reality it is a hostage. Right. Let me start with your second question and then go okay. back to your first one. So, no, for us, East Jerusalem included the entire Palestinian territory, which is a single territory, under international law, you should be able to move between Gaza and Ramallah as you move between Amman and Urbid or Salt. There should be a full ability to move. So the reason why this report focused on the West Bank is because Israel formally dismantled its military government in Gaza in 2005. So right. the military orders that we studied and the prosecutions apply in the West Bank but aren't being used in Gaza. But okay. the legal framework would apply. Yeah. Exactly. The, the framework would apply equally in East Jerusalem and in, in the Gaza Strip. So, um, and, and let me say about the Gaza Strip, on your last point, while Israel formally withdrew its settler population in 2005 and dismantled the military government, it remains in control of the airspace, right. it ma remains control of the borders, and we'll put Rafah to the side for now, so it controls the entry and exit of people and goods, it controls access to the sea, it still registers every baby born in Gaza, it controls the population registry, it controls the value-added tax, it controls the, the buffer zone between uh, Gaza and, and, and Israel. So in, in, in our mind, and not just Human Rights Watch, it's under occupation. It's under, it's under, it's under it's Israel's effective control and under right. occupation. The law of occupation would apply fully, and this is not a controversial opinion among right. uh, international scholars. So moving back to your, the first part of your question, I think certainly there has been a shift uh, in the global discourse. Um, that's not to say, again, that... Uh, concepts like self-determination, sovereignty, etc., are meaningless. You right. know, but you know, from from Human Rights Watch's perspective, when you come to talk about solutions or political realities, it's become a way of deflecting from talking about the situation on the ground. If you really think about it, two-state solution has become such a slogan <laughs> that you almost forget what the problem is. Right. 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 I mean, it's almost like the solution. Uh, you know, the problem is the lack of a solution. So, a two-state solution is almost that is discussed in the discourse by states without regard for why it's needed. And why it's needed? Because settlements are war crimes, because they involve the dispossession of millions of Palestinians, because Palestinians live in a separate uh, system of systematic discrimination, separate unequal treatment. That's why you need a solution to the conflict. So part of what we're trying to do here is to call out the peace process and the two-state solution for what it is. Mm. It's a farce, and it's become worse. It's become a fig leaf. So it's become a, dev a slogan devoid of meaning, and the repetition of it has almost become a way to avoid giving Palestinians what they're due today, right? Removing settlements or ending the closure of Gaza Strip. Right. Yeah. Or granting civil rights. Yeah. This is a legal ob obligation of Israel today, right? right? It's not something that can await. It's contingent on drawing up geographies or redrawing exactly. geographies. Exactly. So for yeah. us, it's important to challenge the prevailing discourse because even today, among, say, European states that want to take a proactive position on uh, the situation on the ground, they're stuck in this fiction of a peace process. Um, and, and that's in our, in our opinion, counterproductive. We right. need to start with addressing rights issues, right. and the answer is action. And once you've dealt with rights issues, you can maybe conceive of a horizon in which we can talk right. about political right. solutions. Which is very sensible. I mean, it really is very sensible, and it sort of gets us out from being stuck in, are you a two-stater, are you a one-stater? I mean, you know, it really is not about the geography, and one state is not necessarily a solution, you know, for yeah. either. Um, it may be a one-state reality, but it really is more about rights. You just hit it right there. Yeah. I mean, whatever you might think the solution is, we live in a one-state reality. Yeah. Yeah. Israel controls the entire territory, in effect, with small pockets of limited Palestinian self-rule from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean, right? right. And... Um, People ask, you know, if, if I were to describe the situation in Israel and Palestine to an um, eight-year-old today, I would do it in these, you know, three, four sentences, and that would be it. Mm. I would say that in this land today, there are about 14 million people, about half of whom are Israeli Jewish, about half of whom are Palestinian. And if you're Palestinian, you're treated unequally. And I would 
stop there. If I had three sentences, that would be my summary. Right. Then, and then different, you would different grades of it, right? That yeah. would be You're my Palestinian citizen of Israel. Right. You have more rights. Yeah. Well, that would be for the 12 year old. For the 12 year old, I might <laughs> tell him Palestinians get different buckets of rights depending on you know where they live. But I, right. but that framing yeah. itself yeah. is one that most is sort of so alien to the conventional way that we think about the situation. But that's right. the reality on the ground. That is. That is, and it's a powerful and simple and realistic way of explaining it. Let's talk about the flip side of it. I mean, you know, to what extent, so you talk about the two-state solution being a fig leaf that is used. To what extent is it used by the Palestinian leadership? You know, to what extent is the Palestinian leadership resistant to the issue of uh, a discussion around rights and then about geography? Because their whole raison d'etre, if you will, their whole yeah. future um, is is anchored in, in this two-state uh, fantasy. Can you speak to that? And then I sure. want to talk about the human rights violations by those entities. No, I mean, look, it's. I think it's quite clear that the, the strategy of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, um, you know, in the development of the Palestinian Authority, has been one that is focused on the um, imperators of sovereignty, you know, embassies, the government, ministries, when in reality the powers on the ground are quite limited, right? Um, you know, they, in the end, you know, uh, the actual authority, the Palestinian authority, even in the West Bank, not even talking about Gaza or East Jerusalem where they don't have authority, is limited. The Israeli army regularly goes into Ramallah, uh, maintains control over resources, over entry and exit of people and goods, collection of that. I mean, the most basic functions of an authority. Detains and arrests and... Exactly. Yeah. And, and the list, don't worry, they do their own arrests, the, yeah. PA, the, yeah. the PA, but... Yeah. But I think part of the, and I think this sort of speaks to it because um, ultimately that strategy um, has failed to change the reality on the ground. The situation right. for Palestinians, even if you look purely at the degree of control, remains quite constricted. So I think ultimately um, what we see, and I think it's taken many different forms, whether you look at the Jerusalem protests around Al-Aqsa Mosque, of 2017, whether you look at the protest against the Palestinian Authority's policy in Gaza in 2018 in Ramallah, whether you look at the march of return that took place uh, and has been taking place in Gaza since early 2018, the hunger strikes in prison, the rhetoric that's actually being used on the ground by Palestinians um, is quite different than I think the rhetoric we're seeing um, at the top level. And frankly, this authority continues to be lack of vision, lack of coherence, lack of ability to, to, to take a very legitimate cause and to shift to actual concrete results on the ground. And frankly, the level of frustration on the ground today um, is coming from someone who's been based between Jerusalem and Ramallah for the last two and a half years with the Palestinian Authority is at a fever pitch. It's driven a lot by the rights abuses, which I hope we'll talk about in a minute, but it's also driven, I think, by a sense that there is not a coherent strategy that is rooted in a vision of dignity, um, human rights, justice, and equality for Palestinians. It's in a narrow vision of sovereignty that may or may not include those things for right. millions of Palestinians, even if it does for West Bank Palestinians. Right. Not those in Gaza, maybe not those in Jerusalem, much less those inside Israel proper or the refugees, including the you know million plus that live in Jordan. So when you shift the argument, when you shift the narrative towards rights, you're basically chipping away at the argument for sovereignty or at the basis, the foundation for what the leadership is working towards. That's, That's not how I would position it. No. I would position it as the following. Israel wants its cake and to eat it too. Israel wants to tell the world there is no occupation. That, I mean, just today, Netanyahu spoke at a conference in which he said, you know, the West Bank is core to, it's a biblical homeland of the Jewish people. So on one hand, Israel wants to say there's no occupation. It's all Israel. On the other hand, it wants to use the law and logic of occupation to not provide the rights that Palestinians are due. We want to call out that bluff. Right. In essence, Israel has, has, has given itself three choices today, frankly, if you want to really think about where Israel is today. It has three choices. It can either grant full equal rights to Palestinians, which it has shown no sign of having any desire to do. It can ethnically cleanse what remains of Palestinians in the occupied territory, which I hope the world wouldn't tolerate. Or, 
apartheid. And frankly, we may already be there today. Right. So Israel needs to be forced to, to grapple with the end result of decades of rights abusing policy. And by focusing on the, on, on the rights-based element, you force it to grapple with that choice. You hopefully push to a situation in which you can create the basis for a long-term you know, solution. But we're so far from that today right. and that we need to anchor and root our rhetoric in rights. Right, and what I really meant was on the Palestinian leadership side of things, that the argument for rights is a little, it's threatening in, right. in, in many ways. Um, you know, we talk so much about human rights violations by the Israelis. Can we, I mean, you know, in 2018, you published the report, or Human Rights Watch published the report, two authorities, one way, zero dissent, right? And in it, you focus on the machines of repression uh, created by the Palestinian Authority and Hamas to crush dissent, right? You know, there are arbitrary arrests, mistreatment, torture at the hands of both Hamas and the PA, um, stifling of free speech, free speech and expression. And you deal with that also with the Human Rights Watch report of 2019 that came earlier. Talk to us about that and sure. how do you, um, yeah, I mean, sort of first enlighten us on the nature of those violations and what, what you've uncovered in your work sure. about them. So we, as you've noted, we've done two major reports um, based on the first one, two years of research, the second one, a uh, follow-up uh, in, the, in the, the following six months. What we found is that both the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Hamas authorities in Gaza are systematically arbitrarily arresting critics and opponents, torturing those in detention, and there's a lack of accountability for these abuses. So on the arbitrary arrest piece, both with the PA, again, in, in, in the West Bank and Hamas and Gaza, arrests of independent journalists, people who demonstrate, those who criticize um, on Facebook, um, those that are affiliated with the rival political group, Hamas, you know, being for the PA in the West Bank, Hamas, and for vice Gaza, versa. it's yeah. vice Fetah, but also former PA employees. So we've seen really significant uptick in arbitrary arrest. Let me just give you the most recent research that's the most relevant. According to numbers we got from the Palestinian Authority itself, in 2018 and the first three months of 2019, the Palestinian Authority detained 1,609 people wow. solely for two charges. Two charges. One was insulting higher authorities, and the second was uh, creating sectarian strife. 1,609 people in 15 months on those two charges alone. Uh, we also in uh, how, how do you create sectarian strife there? I mean, how do they define they, that? They basically use that uh, as, uh, a cover. As, a, as a slogan for political opposition. Okay. That's basically what they do. Okay. Um, in addition, they, by their own, this is their own figures. This is not Human Rights Watch's figures, right? They, they say they've detained over 800 people in 2018 for social media posts, the PA. Hamas is doing the same thing in Gaza. According to the Independent Commission of Human Rights, a Palestinian statutory body, during the March 2019 Bidnan Aish, We Want to Live protests, Hamas detained over 1,000 people during this you know, series of protests for a couple of weeks. Many for hours, not days, but just to give you a sense of this. And they have provided us numbers that are also quite astounding. So on one hand, arbitrary arrest. If you criticize these authorities, you're going to be detained. Most of these detentions, I used to cover Egypt for Human Rights Watch. This is not an Egypt situation of multiple year disappearances. Usually a matter of weeks, maybe a couple of months, you're detained and then you're roughed up in detention, threatened, and you're sort of as a way to deter you from future activism. Torture is systematic. It happens to people in both the West Bank and Gaza using a variety of tactics, which I can talk more about, the, the major one being shebah, or positional torture of different forms. And there's been virtually no accountability for these crimes, zero convictions. Many people report complaints. Few lead to uh, investigations, fewer to... But by whom? To whom do they report these complaints? These complaints either go to the Independent Commission for Human Rights, uh, Human Rights which is a joint sort of semi-independent, semi-statutory body, or to the agencies themselves, so to the, um, uh, in the West Bank, the Mukhabarat, the intelligence, the Waqai, the preventive security, or to um, the Joint Security Commission, which is a joint... Uh, body of different security forces. In Gaza, it goes usually to the Interior Ministry, which has its own sort of branches. And then there's no accountability. So um, let me take a step back and connect it to what we talked about earlier. 
the PA, I said, has very limited authority. The only thing they really do well is repression, right? <laughs> so they don't control the checkpoint one kilometer from Abu Mazen's house, from, from Mahmoud Abbas's house, but yet they're detaining hundreds of people and, and, and really have created a machinery of repression. And by the way, it's not been, it's been 25 years, right? Two and a half decades that they've been doing this. And so we did this report as a way to make clear that this is a serious issue. And again, the level of frustration on the ground with Palestinian authorities is through the roof. And there's talk now of elections. I mean, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. I can tell you from having met in 2019 Mohammed Ishtaya, the Prime Minister, um, the uh, Intelligence Chief Majid Faraj, many other senior PA officials, I haven't been reassured that these, pro the, that these um, abuses will stop. While there have been some words on some areas, um, nothing suggests to me that there is any movement towards respecting a plurality and diversity of political opinions in Palestine. How have your efforts been to try to shed light on those uh, violations, on, on, on the treatment, I mean, you know, on, on the actions? Of sure. The I mean, we Party. released this major report in October uh, of 2018, which received a lot of attention. To the Palestinian Authority's credit, uh, the day before the report was due to be released, um, we were, th you know, threatened quite in public statements, uh, more or less told that in public statements that, that we were, uh, had signed up to Trump's deal of the century and that this was part of the pressure on the PA. In private statements, we were summoned to the Interior Ministry, to the President's office, and you know, we were more or less told, don't publish the report. Mm -hmm. uh, we insisted on publishing it, and we had a press conference um, in Ramallah, and I've continued to maintain contacts with the Palestinian Authority, which again, I mean, the Israeli government deported me over my human rights work. So I think it's a, they, sh they have credit, I think, for continuing to engage us in providing information. Hamas has, uh, we've maintained contact with them. The problem is actually on the Israeli side, where in the last 12 years, the Israeli government has, uh, since 2007, uh, 2008, sorry, so 11 years, the Israeli government has permitted Human Rights Watch's foreign staff entry into Gaza one time in the period of over a decade. Right, so that so our ability to why is that? Is that because they're concerned about what you will uncover, you know, that will hold them culpable? No, it's actually a part of the generalized closure policy. So since 2007, and it's actually worth me emphasizing this even to an audience I think that is more familiar with the situation. Israel has a generalized ban on travel to Gaza. So nobody in, nobody out, unless you fall within a narrow list of humanitarian exemptions. So there's an exemption if you get a permit and need an urgent medical procedure, or if you work for a humanitarian organization, um, or for family reasons. But there is no, and there's also an exemption if you're a journalist accredited by the Israeli Press Association. Right. But there is no exemption for human rights workers. Right. So it's not just Human Rights Watch. Amnesty, Palestinian groups have all faced a similar restriction. So the one time the Israeli government let us in in 2016, it was on an exceptional basis. And when we tried to follow up and do visits, including, by the way, in October 2018, uh, we sought to go to Gaza to release a report that found that Hamas is systematically torturing dissidents um, and to have a press conference in Gaza City, we were denied. We were denied a permit to um, uh, do advocacy around two Israeli civilians who have been disappeared um, by Hamas, which is also, uh, actually, it's a, it's, it's a very serious violation of international law, and we've called for Hamas to release these civilians. That report, even to go push Hamas to release Israelis held by Hamas, we were denied. It's because it's emblematic of a policy that's not a security-based policy. Right. right. It's a generalized right. ban on travel. And by right. the way, it also applies to our Palestinian staff member in Gaza, who um, until January of 2018, until two years ago, had never left Gaza in her entire life, largely as a result of Israeli I travel remember. restrictions. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, she was allowed to leave for the first time, um, not because they allowed Human Rights Watch, but because ultimately the U.S. Embassy uh, put in a request at our uh, suggestion for her to leave. When we applied for another permit for her several months later, it was denied. Not because she was a threat, but because this is a part of a larger policy, a failed policy, I may add, which yeah. is meant to yeah. keep yeah. the people of Gaza caged into that and, territory. And distrust of any human rights activists who go into Gaza, right? Exactly. Uh, let's turn back to the West Bank for, for just a couple of minutes and uh, about the rights violations and specifically 
um, uh, human rights related to freedom of expression, but also gender uh, and sexuality um, uh, repression. So the PA repealed in 2018 the marry your rapist law, right? Uh, the human rights situation on the ground remains very, very difficult for women. So I wonder if you can talk about that and <coughs> talk about it also with respect to uh, LGBT individuals, yeah. um, especially that we had not too long ago uh, Al Qaus, which is, I guess, an illegal uh, because you can't have a legal LGBT yeah. advocacy. Uh, group in the um, Palestinian territories came under tremendous pressure by the Palestinian Authority and they were blocked from having um, holding any events in the uh, in the West Bank by the PA police and I guess you know just on on, on women's issues uh, the case of um, Isra Ghraib right yep. in Beit Sahur last year was just yep. incredibly um, incredibly troubling. So maybe you can talk a little sure. bit about that narrower definition of, of human rights, but an incredibly important one. Sure. So let me start with the question about Palestinian women. So um, Palestine in 2018, for the first time in its history, went in front of the uh, UN Human Rights Committee to evaluate its human rights record. And the first treaty that um, looked at its record was CEDA, the Convention Against the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And, um, you know, that provided an opportunity for pa really brave Palestinian human rights and feminist organization to push for a repeal of marry your rapist laws. For those who aren't familiar, many countries in the Arab world, a relic of colonialism, including Jordan, till recently had laws that allowed a rapist to escape punishment for their crime if they married their victim and they stayed married together for a certain number of years. Palestine imported this law from the Jordanian law, which Jordan later repealed, but wasn't repealed around in the Palestine, same time. Yeah. around the same time. But we had Lebanon, Jordan, a number of other countries repeal Morocco, it, yeah. Morocco, but it remained in the books in the West Bank. So there was a positive step taken in 2018 that that law was repealed. There also was a change in Palestinian law that removed um, a clause that allowed for a sentencing of a violent criminal to be reduced if it was deemed an honor crime. And there also was provisions made that allowed um, single mothers to open bank accounts for um, obtain passports for their kids, etc. So there were some changes made on the eve of CEDA by the Palestinian Authority. I should note for those who are less familiar that there's not been a Palestine Legislative Council for 13 years since the divide between Fatah and, and Hamas. So all laws are issued by decree by the President, President Abbas, who's in the 15th year of a four-year term. Right, so, but that's the only way law is unfortunately made. So, unfortunately, the situation when it comes, and we've had the same requests when it comes to issues around violence against women, uh, when it comes to the deep discrimination that remains in um, social status, when it comes to marriage, divorce, inheritance, guardianship, these remain really, really significant issues. Um, and the lack of the Palestinian Legislative Council has been a problem, but also, I would say generally, uh, you know, that Palestine has been more progressive, I think, on some of these issues than other countries in the Arab world. Like what? Um, in, in general, there's, there, you know, there's more space, I think, to talk about issues around LGBT ah. rights, gender sexuality, than there is in some other countries. Okay. And I'll give you an example in a minute when it comes yeah. to LGBT rights. You know, however, we've now seen a pushback. So if folks that follow Palestinian uh, news have known that in the last month or two, there's been a pushback from more conservative elements of Palestinian society against the fact that Palestine ratified the Convention Against the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women without reservation. There's been actually meetings of tribal groups, et cetera, pushing for Palestine. That led President Abbas's advisor, I think a couple of weeks ago around the holidays, to say that we will not issue, make any laws that conflict with the culture, religion, traditions of Palestine. So, so even though there were some advances, some advances on this, and then it, there's it pushback. Pulls back. Yeah. And actually, a lot of the pushback focused on us and WICLAC, which is the uh, major Palestinian women's rights. Right. So the, the struggle is ongoing. So on LGBT rights, um, there's a lot that can be said. But let me start by saying, obviously, um, the Israeli government is well known of using um, gay rights as a way to whitewash its systematic repression of Palestinians. Um, the reality on the ground is much more nuanced if you actually look at the situation of LGBT Palestinians. While homosexual conduct is criminalized in the Gaza Strip, 
Um, that's a relic of Egyptian law. It's not um, in the West Bank. Whereas in the West Bank, it's not because that's uh, Jordanian law exactly. does not criminalize homosexuality. Exactly. Activity. And there has long been groups like Al Qos, which you mentioned, which operate throughout the occupied Palestinian territory. There are others, um, Aswath, which operates in Haifa, right. etc. Um, the reality on the ground is, of course, like many other parts of the Arab world, there are difficulties that gay, lesbian, Palestinians face. But most of it is about protection of their basic rights. It's about, you know, the um, equality, treated, being treated equally, being free from violence, etc. So what we've started to see, though, it's a very troubling trend, um, in the last, I'd say, four months in the West Bank, yeah. is the beginnings of some sort of systematic crackdown against LGBT organizing. It began with, as you mentioned, with a statement by the Palestinian Authority police spokesman um, that Al Qos, which is a major LGBT community group, was outlawed from operating in the West Bank. We immediately wrote to the Palestinian police. They immediately wrote back saying that they had retracted that statement, that it was you know, removed from being online. However, they never did so publicly. This was only in a letter to Human Rights Watch, and that statement has now been used to make it much more difficult for El Qos members to rent venues, to organize events, etc. It's also... But it's also triggered... It's exactly it. Yeah. It's unleashed uh, yeah. the homophobia and other violent tendencies against um, LGBT Palestinians. Right. So we've seen um, a number of examples of violence being committed, which again has not been something that I would say happens on a systematic basis. It's much more, for example, violence against women has been much more of something that we've seen in Palestinian, um, I would say, uh, families in, inside Israel and in the West Bank than, for example, violence against queer Palestinians. But we've started to see more of that, but even more troubling, I'll give you an example. Um, in November at al Najah University in Nablus, we, be, we saw a number of students who were called into investigative committees about their distribu distribution of flyers much, months, months before for El Qos, information about LGBT issues. Months later, they were called in for investigative committees. Some were threatened with expulsion. At some were university. referred to the police at the university, mm. at Najah and Nablus. Yeah. That sort of thing, and we've also seen interrogations of Palestinian activists in, in uh, Ramallah and other cities where they're being questioned by Palestinian police about their LGBT community and activism. So we've seen this trend happening. Um, of course, though, I think it's worth noting, and I'll, even with this audience, I'll note that I think most Palestinian queers will tell you the number one obstacle to the expression of their gender and sexual identity remains the Israeli occupation and systematic discrimination against them by the Israeli government. Let me make an obvious point. Al Qos, their major office is in East Jerusalem. Right. If you're a Palestinian in Nablus that's seeking community, what's the number one obstacle for it? It's the, the fact occupation. that you can't go into East Jerusalem yeah. without a permit and checkpoints, right. etc. So I think it's worth contextualizing all these yeah. issues. So it's, it's a very nuanced, complicated picture, and our advocacy strategy on these issues has differed a bit, but it's definitely an area of focus. Right. Omar, um, I want to turn to the audience, so let's just uh, you know, go to one more um, or, or revisit one area before we do that, and that is uh, to talk about your recent deportation and talk about the Israeli government's attitude and stance on international NGOs uh, and activists. And you know, on this same theater, we had um, Tarek Bakoni just a couple of months ago, right? And uh, he came from Jerusalem, Ramallah, where he lives, Jerusalem, where he works, as the Israel-Palestine director of uh, the International Crisis Group. And he couldn't go back because his work permit had expired yeah. about three months before and he couldn't renew it. And I think, I'm not sure, you probably have more recent information than I do. I think he's still in London um, waiting for the Israeli government to renew his work permit. Uh, so we see more and more of this. Is this... Um, where do you see it all going? I mean, you know, there is, you know, you're not dealing with, you're dealing with Human Rights Watch, you're dealing with um, International Crisis Group. Um, and perhaps within that, well, let, let me stop here and I'll come sure. back and talk about BDS. Yeah, Yeah. look, I mean, uh, you, as you mentioned in your introduction, my deportation case received a lot of press attention, but it's not exceptional. What's happened to me is a part of a systematic assault uh, on human rights advocacy. 
Um, it starts, of course, the most affected are Palestinians. But let's kind of crack back the onion. So it starts with denying entry to international rights activists. You mentioned Professor Frankie of Columbia Law School, uh, representatives of Amnesty International, countless other ordinary Palestinian other activists. So the next layer, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll get back to what my case does in a minute, but let me just sort of paint the larger picture. Denials of entry. Uh, you have Israeli rights activists who are being accused of being um, uh, slandering the army or their state or being uh, traitors like Haggai Lad. Like Haggai Lad and Mickey and Avner, and, and they come, um, they become threatened, right? Absolutely. Physically. Uh, and in the case of Mickey, the new Israel Fund, I think he was named personally by Netanyahu in a speech about a year Absolutely, ago. an infiltration uh, of some of these groups. I mean, uh, Funding restrictions, we, so many different layers. And of course, Palestinian rights activists get it the worst. Uh, to take one example, because it's, it's one that's near and dear to my heart, Leith Abu Ziyad, yeah. who is a campaigner for a Amnesty International uh, in uh, Palestine, who was issued a travel ban as a punitive measure and was not allowed to go to East Jerusalem. I mean, literally, he's in Izariya, which is like... 12 kilometers, maybe 10 kilometers yeah. from Jerusalem yeah. to visit his mother who was going, undergoing chemotherapy. Over the holidays, his mother passed away. And he wasn't able to spend his last moments. This is a human rights defender. A travel ban for undisclosed security reasons. He actually was due to come to Jordan because he, uh, to, to attend a, a funeral for a relative. We're not allowed to, to, to go out. Travel bans. And this is, a, again, Palestinian staff member from an international organization. Arrests, etc. So there's a, a much larger picture. In that context, I, I do think my case was an effort by the Israeli government to sort of redraw the lines. In essence, by kicking out a representative of one of the world's largest human rights organization, and doing so, by the way, based on our work. You know, you mentioned the introduction. Initially, they focused on my activism when I when was a at student Stanford. at Stanford. Yeah. But when we went to court... You know, the law and actually the guidelines passed by the Interior Ministry and a case at the Supreme Court that was pending while my case was pending required support for boycotts to be active and continuous. And so they had to focus on my work at Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch, by the way, takes no position on the BDS movement or right. boycotts of Israel more generally. Right. What we do as we do across the world is we document abuses by companies as we do by governments and we call for companies to refrain from contributing to rights abuse. There is no more basic form of human rights advocacy than telling a company don't abuse rights. What we've done in the context of Israel-Palestine, and this is over the course of years of research, is determined that if a company works in a settlement, they're invariably complicit in rights abuse, right? Because they receive permits that are systematically denied to Palestinians, infrastructure, roads, water. They're operating on land stolen from Palestinians across the West Bank. They are partaking in a separate and unequal system of laws where a Palestinian laborer... Do you even have to go to that specificity? I mean, you know, they're, op they're benefiting commercially yeah. by uh, placing, you know, lo locating their enterprises in a place that is illegally settled. It's, right? You're right. That's number, I mean, it's, it should, a, it's, be, a, it's a straight IHL there. violation, yeah. international humanitarian yeah. law. But yeah. even if you say, well, that's a political issue, I don't want to deal with it, concretely. It's illegal. But more than the illegality, concretely, the act of that business is directly contributing to rights abuse in violation of the UN guiding principles. Right. So, what, for example, Airbnb, which is a report that we published about a year ago, yeah. I mean, by, I mean, Airbnb was literally brokering rentals on property stolen from Palestinians who themselves can't live there, right? And by doing that, they're further entrenching the settlement enterprise. So on Airbnb, for example, we didn't say boycott Airbnb. We said that, Air, that, that Airbnb shouldn't be operating in settlements. But, so what is it? So and I think you, lose, you use sort of the legal argument in that those settlements are actually on lands where there are deeds to those lands right. uh, by Palestinians who had lived there before right. the occupation. That's right? exactly right. I mean, yeah. we interviewed Palestinians yeah. who showed us and we documented that had deeds to the very land that an Airbnb is now on. That Palestinian can't even pay to stay in that Airbnb if you wanted to right. because Palestinians can't enter settlements except as laborers bearing a special permit. But going back to the point of my case, 
So by going after Human Rights Watch, and by the way, this was not, this was a two and a half year battle. I mean, if you want to go back, Human Rights, I, I took this role in October 2016. Human Rights Watch in July of 2016 applied for a permit to hire a foreign employee. And I was going to apply for a work visa under that. That process should take 60 days. It right. took eight months. Wow. In February of 2017, the Israeli government said Human Rights Watch could not hire a foreign employee at all. And the reason was because Human Rights Watch is not a real human rights group, according to the Israeli government. We are propagandists for the Palestinians. We went public. Within 12 hours, Netanyahu himself ordered a reversal, according to Israeli press, in that decision. I later obtained a tourist visa under, and then eventually a work visa under that permit. I arrived for the first time in Ben Gurion Airport, April 26, 2017. By the way, you mentioned that the, the, the boycott law was passed in your induction on March 6th. It was passed when I was on an airplane flying, literally on an airplane flying to Ben Gurion Airport. To Ben Gurion Airport. Yeah, I landed and the law had passed in the time that I was on an airplane. But, that but, wasn't, it, but it was too late for it to be applied well, to but you. Th they applied it to my next visit, which was in right. April of 20. So I, I arrived April 26, 2017. Yeah. I mentioned that date because on April 27th, 2017, Shrat Hadin, which is a Israeli organization tied to the settler movement, right. filed a lawsuit against the Israeli government, saying that the Israeli government violated the law by allowing me in. Shurat Hadin, by the way, their social media manager for a long time was one Yair Netanyahu. So Netanyahu's son, son was part of an organization suing the Israeli government, headed by Benjamin Netanyahu, alleging that the law was violated by allowing me in. Now that case led to a government investigation. It led the go Israeli government for the first time in its history to our information to provide a human rights defender with its intelligence dossier on me. So the government provided me with its intelligence file on me to justify its decision in May of 2018 to order my deportation um, over claims that I supported the BDS movement. They gave me two weeks to leave in May. We, so again, the first time their argument was about me it was about Human Rights Watch being a propaganda arm. That failed, so then they, the day after lawsuit, they investigate me, intelligence dossier, order me deported over claims of supporting boycott. We go to the court and say this violates Israeli law, and I was basically the last year and a half living in uh, Jerusalem uh, based on a court-ordered injunction. So for much of that time, I couldn't leave and ultimately, in court, the government said Human Rights Watch's work itself is boycott. But why are they going after me, not Human Rights Watch? They said, well, Human Rights Watch covers 100 countries. You just do this, which is, you know, that's my job. I'm the Israel Palestine <laughs> director. I used to cover Egypt, but that's my job right now. Right. So their argument went to the point of saying Human Rights Watch itself. And by the way, the Supreme Court's decision, which came on November 5th, makes crystal clear that even if you're engaged in human rights advocacy, the most basic form of human rights advocacy, that is grounds for denial of entry deportation under Israeli law. So what the Israeli government did, and they, you know, this decision was condemned by um, the European Union, by the UN Secretary General, by UN Special Rapporteurs, by everybody and everybody's aunt and mother. But the Israeli government still did it, right? And I think it was done for a clear purpose. If today, and it happened now a month and, and a half ago, or something whereabouts, yeah. they deported Human Rights Watch without consequence, what's going to stop them in two months from detaining a Palestinian human rights defender or shutting down an Israeli human rights group? I mean, they've that, now that's, that's going precedent. to be my question. I mean, does this apply to uh, Israeli human rights organizations as much as it does to international human rights organizations? <clears throat> so there's a legal answer and a non legal answer. Yeah. The legal answer is no, it technically yeah. doesn't, because yeah, this was think. an interpretation of an amendment to Israel. Israel's law of entry, which only applies, applies to, to non-Israelis. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But the logic, and Gideon Levy had a great op-ed that explained this uh, on my case, the logic was that this form of advocacy harms Israel, right? That, that it's a, a threat to the state. So if it's a threat to the state if uttered by me, why is it not a threat if uttered by an Israeli or a Palestinian? I mean, it's only a matter of time before that same logic is turned around and used against Israel. And they're already using it, right? I mean, right. Uh, uh, so if you look at the history of the anti-boycott they're, they're not using it legally, though, right? Well, I mean, they're, they're putting pressure. They're, 
In a sense, but l- yeah. let, me, let me just talk about the anti-boycott law. 2011, Israel passes a law that says that if you call for boycott, you can be sued in civil court in Israel, right? right? And you could pay damages. That was 2011. 2017, the government amends the law of entry to deny entry to boycott activists. In 2019, the Israeli government deported a human rights defender from an international organization which takes no position on boycotts, right? So look at how the, the, yeah, at yeah. the same time, right. the, gov- the interior ministry announced that it was investigating Omar Barghouti, the co-founder of the BDS movement, his residency status. He's been living in uh, Israel-Palestine for the last 20-plus years over claims of, you know, about boycott. So his permanent residency is now being studied. So you can see the way the pendulum is moving. Will anybody be surprised in two years, again, if, if the trajectory stays the same, if people are denied entry for calling Israel an apartheid state or calling for the International Criminal Court to open a formal well, probe. Which is what's happening in the United States. I mean, look at how the pendulum has also moved from, you know, being anti-BDS right. to making it illegal to boycott Israel to now making it illegal, basically. I mean, you know, it, it, it's on college campuses to be critical of Israel. That's exactly That's what right. what it boils down to. And, and yeah. I mean, it's, it's different terms are used, but we've seen that trajectory happening. Right. So, I mean... Nobody sh- in this room should be surprised if in two years, again, look at the International Criminal Court, which just, you know, right. um, uh, the, the prosecutor a few weeks ago announced her decision to, in essence, close the preliminary examination right. and request the court to review the, its, ju- uh, its jurisdiction. I can talk more about the details because right. it was misreported, I think, in much of the press. But um, would anybody be surprised in two years if an Israeli human rights defender is criminally prosecuted for uh, collaborating with the International Criminal no, Court. I, I mean, the trajectory is quite yeah. clear. So I, 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 let me just say, sort of in, in wrapping up my answer to your question, we have used the platform of my case as a way to ring the alarm bell, not because I'm the worst victim. By no means. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm an I'm man, you know, I'm not, a, 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 you know, I, I didn't, my home wasn't demolished. I wasn't, I'm not a person in Gaza who has been under caged in open air prison for over a decade, but we tried to use it to say, if this is happening to, to me, you can imagine what's happening now and what might happen sure. to others. Sure. And I would have loved to end on a positive note, which maybe you can address in the Q&A, and that is how all of this is backfiring. Yeah. And how it's going to backfire even further. Do you want me to answer that now? Or? Sure. Okay. Well, I'll just give a short answer. By the way, I'm an optimist, so I'm happy to end yeah. with optimism. But yeah. no, I mean, I think it absolutely backfired on the Israeli yeah. government. Yeah. I mean, um, there's so many different data points, but the world saw this as an attack on the human rights movement. Right. The world did not see this as about boycotts or anything else. I mean, the front page of the Hebrew new- of Haaretz, Again, left newspaper in Israel. The front page above the fold the day after my deportation was me speaking at the airport with Israeli human rights defenders holding that. a sign saying, you can't hide the occupation. That's Israel's nightmare, right? Yeah. Is this unified front. Let me tell you, in my experience, and again, it's limited. I've worked on many other issues. Not just Israel. I've never seen a moment when the human rights movement in Israel-Palestine, Israeli-Palestine International, has been as clear-eyed and united in its assessment and diagnosis of what the situation is on the ground and what's needed going forward. I think you have incredibly brave, courageous leadership on the ground. You have this incredible moment, and this moment is in part created by the hubris of the Israeli and the, united, and, and the American government. I, I, after I was deported, I, I was in 10 countries in uh, 14 days, spoke to the European Parliament, met many senior European officials. There is serious concern in the international community. And I think that's why we started talking about the peace. I think there's a, there's a, uh, a challenge in terms of what do we do, what is the kind of discourse that we're using, but in terms of the awareness and about the shift and, and, and understanding the, the reality for what it is, I, I see a tangible shift at many, many levels, and I can say more. In, in That's tonight. great. That's great. That's a great note to yeah. end on. Thank you, Omar. Uh, let's turn it to, uh, to questions. There are people, as always, with microphones, and I'm going to uh, remind everyone to please introduce yourself. Uh, please be incredibly succinct. One question with a question mark at the end. Uh, we'll start with the uh, woman over here, please.
مرحبا يعطيكم العافية بس بدون تصوير إذا سمحت أه. شكرا معكم سوزان اسمحوا لي أحكي بالعربي أول شيء كنت أحكي عن حالات المنع الأمني اللي أنت تدرجت فيها من البي دي أس نزولا ل... إحنا أوريدي وصلنا للي أنت بتحكي فيه أنا أكتيفست في موضوع الأسرة الأدمنستريتف ديتنشن أنا أوريدي علي منع أمني من تو يرز بقدرش أروح عند زوجي هو عايش في الثمانية وأربعين أنا هون فأوريدي وصلنا لهاي المرحلة I don't know ليش علي منع أمني لأنه ما فيش من المحكمة أي سبب قانوني إنه علي منع أمني فإحنا أوريدي وصلنا المرحلة اللي أنت بتقول after two years رح نوصلها من two years I'm fighting في المحاكم ما فيش سبب now coming to this أو mentioning this uh, human rights watch عندها أي إحصائيات عن عدد المنع الأمني اللي أنا بسمعه left and right لكيسز similar اللي اليهود ما بيبرروها وإنت بتروح المحكمة and you don't know ليش you're banned yeah. وهل في أي action legally بيقدروا ياخدوه في authorities higher than this Uh, regarding المنع الأمني regarding السجن الإداري regarding سجن الأطفال regarding حالات العنف اللي بتصير في الثمانية وأربعين وهم ما بيحققوا فيها ولا بيعملوا فيها أي شيء Do you want me to translate it? Please. So the question is basically about um, security bans and uh, the, if we have statistics about that and sort of can speak more generally about the practice of Israel banning movement or travel based on security blocks. It's a really good question. And my point about two years um, was more about um, going after Israelis because they, in, in the, they've definitely been doing this for Palestinians for many, many years. Um, The pro we don't, so the short answer is we don't have statistics, but you're absolutely right. I can just tell you from the network of um, Palestinian intellectuals, activists that I engage with as part of my job, you sit around the table, half of the room has a security ban uh, of some sort. Uh, what the Israeli government often does is uses this as a coercive tactic um, to get people to confess, to give information, to identify networks. And it'll be based often on nothing or maybe a sentence in an interrogation or a pure associational claim. We know the Israeli government is engaged in significant social media monitoring. Uh, that's something that's documented in this report yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, Can canary mission, I mean, I need, I'm not talking about this canary mission is non-government groups. I'm talking about the Israeli well, we government We don't know itself. that, right? I mean, we, don't, we still don't know who funds it. I mean, exactly. I suspect it's Sheldon Adelson and even Netanyahu may be involved. But, but, what but by the Israeli about? government's own admission, yes, right, okay. they've carried right. out hundreds of arrests of Palestinians. Yeah. Palestinians based on their social media posts. And we've documented yeah. a number of right. those cases. We know there are databases used that make connections between different people. The reason why there are no statistics on security bans is because you have to, there's, there's no centralized, you know, for example, on detainees, we have numbers because we can go to the Israeli prison services and request that information. The security bans, they're run by Shabak, the security service, And um, they don't provide that information. We wrote to Shabak, for example, uh, in, in relation to this report on a different topic, on the social media monitoring. We got a response from the prime minister's office that they won't provide information. So the only way you can document it is reverse engineering, is to go to people who have travel bans and find them and count the numbers. But that's inherently under-inclusive. And frankly, many people that have security bans don't come forward because they're, they want to travel to visit their spouse or, or for other reasons. So, you know, I know of one case of somebody who ha has a spouse in Europe who is Palestinian in the West Bank, um, wanted to go to marry her and um, was told he has a security ban. He filed a lawsuit. I mean, he's one of the few people that could amass money, filed the lawsuit in court, and the Shabak offered him a compromise. We will let you go for two weeks to visit her and come back and we will temporarily lift your travel ban. And, you know, like many humans, he wanted to go see his partner. He went. He came back, and the travel ban was reinstated. So it's a very coercive system that keeps people stuck in, in, in here. So there's no statistics. There is legal recourse, but only in the individual case. And it's very expensive for most people to hire lawyers 
to, to go through that process. So, and that's part of why our report's released, because part of what we're saying in our report is that Israel, can, and by the way, and sorry to have a long answer, but I think it's an important point. You made a very good point. People who are, for example, al Damir, which is a Palestinian prisoner rights organization. It's a respected international NGO. We work with them. Many others work with it. They've had staff members, board members in detention, you know, as well. So it's quite clear that these sort of associational claims, in essence, what the Israeli government is trying to say is if you speak out, if you affiliate, associate with people opposed to the occupation, you know, you are liable to face a consequence. And that's part of what our report's trying to say. And that might have been okay, you know, you know, maybe in a six month or one year occupation. But if you're doing this for 53 years, you are shredding the fabric of intellectual, social, political life for millions of people under occupation. Which is exactly the intent. <laughs> the gentleman here, and then, yeah. My question will be very brief. Uh, how compliant do you think is the Israeli jurisdictional system with human rights? Do you think there is a lot of contradictions between human rights and the current Israeli jurisdictional system? And the other question, do you think Israel is a just state or not? I mean, I think Israel is um, systematically repressing millions of people committing serious human rights abuses. We've documented for a number of years the serious due process. I mean, military courts have a, depending on the year, 95 to 99 percent conviction rate. Um, you know, children who go in detention are regularly coerced into essentially plea deals that are quite unjust. So, of course, you can't, uh, let, me, let me put it this way. Um, there can be no state that, you can't call a state just that uh, for 53 years uh, denies millions of people their most basic civil and political rights. As my friend Hagai Al-Ad wrote, um, you know, he, he put it very succinctly, democracy is rule of the people, not the rule of one people over the other. Um, and, and, and quite simply today, um, whether it be in the West Bank, whether it be in Gaza, whether it be inside Israel, Israel systematically maintains systems of institutional and trans discrimination against Palestinians. Your rights are fundamentally dependent on who you are, and there is no just system that's built on that foundation. Right, right. And Haggai, actually, in his uh, in Beth Salem's uh, end of year appeal, uh, you know, the banner is. We want to cease to exist as an organization. Right. <laughs> you know, we look forward to the day when there are no human rights violations that we uh, report on. We did not speak, of course, today about justice within Israel. Um, you know, and, and the rights of Palestinian citizens of Israel compared to um, Israelis. So you're talking specifically about the judiciary. Yeah. 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 Okay. Got it. So, in terms of the judiciary. Yeah. Look, we filed a challenge. We had a hearing in court, right? But a country that calls itself a democracy. Sp I mean, I'm sitting in court. They're spending hours reading my tweets. <laughs> and not for calling for violence, but whether or not this form of human rights advocacy is permissible in the country. So yes, there was a hearing. There was argument. There was discussion. There was conversation. But at the end of the day, the court put its stamp on the government's systematic assault on human rights advocacy. The Israeli Supreme Court has never despite its popular myth, been in most, in almost all cases, a real check on the Israeli government. It signed off on use of force gunning down protesters in Gaza. It signed off on settlements being legal, even though it's a clear violation of the Fourth, fourth Geneva Convention. They've signed off on punitive, I mean, go down the list of human rights abuses. The court has put its stamp on all of it. So I think the answer to your question is, 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 is evident from- Even under Aharon Barak, who's celebrated- Absolutely. Sort of yeah. Okay. Next gentleman over there. My name is Mohammed, and thank you very much for this informative discussion. 
So Israel disengaged from Gaza in 2005, and the claim is that they don't have any responsibility over Gaza. And in this case, legally, who should be held accountable for access of movement and access of services to two million people in Gaza? Yeah. And my second question is, what do you think about, like, in the light of the absence of the presidential decree for establishing elections, how this would affect from a legal perspective on any claim that Palestinian Authority should or would go uh, against the, the Israel occupation. Thanks. So, uh, I mean, on your first question, I think I, I mentioned earlier that the ways in which Israel still maintains effective control over the Gaza Strip. So, I mean, the one who's responsible for access limitations is the one who's denying the access, right? So, I didn't talk about Egypt earlier, but let me say a word about Egypt because obviously e Egypt has its own border crossing uh, with, with Gaza, but there's a difference in, in, in people, as you mentioned in the introduction, I'm, I'm certainly, I'm, you know, I can't go back to Egypt because of my human rights reporting if there's serious human rights abuses, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, but, but the obligation of Egypt and Israel is different. Israel is the occupying power in Gaza, right? And among other things, it blocks access between one territorial entity, between Gaza right. and the West Bank. So even if a Palestinian leaves Gaza, goes to Cairo, flies to Amman, and then tries to cross the border, it's still an Israeli on the other side that decide whether or not he goes in. So Israel, under the law of occupation, has an obligation to provide for the life of Palestinians in Gaza. So, you know, it's clearly not doing that um, because of its limitations on goods coming in and out, people coming in and out, and a series of other issues. You know, it can increase the capacity of water, electricity, it can increase the movement of peoples, and it's obligated to do that. But Egypt is also complicit in the serious rights abuses in Egypt, right? in, in, in Gaza, right? For a number of years until the, the you know, May of 2018 from, from the coup, so you know, 2013, July until, or August, until uh, May of uh, 2018, Egypt effectively sealed its border with Gaza. It was opened a few days a year. So it was a part of turning Gaza into an open-air prison. Since May of 2018, the border has been opened much more frequently. And by the way, if you look at statistics in Europe now, if, uh, people are showing up on, uh, you know, in Europe as displaced refugees. Palestinians from Gaza are among the highest communities in recent years because there's been a flow of people out of Gaza into um, Egypt and then, and then, the and, then and then elsewhere yeah. to Europe and to Turkey. But but all that's to say Egypt also has has a role there, and of course the Palestinian Authority and Hamas also Hamas has, has a, ha, yeah, have, a, have yeah. a significant role yeah. to play as well yeah. because they've used the people of Gaza as political footballs for a long time. The Palestinian Authority was imposing punitive measures on Gaza, restricting you know medical referrals um, and in, in the aid that it was receiving etc and at the same time of course Gaza the Hamas authorities in Gaza have been you know in some cases diverting resources for the people of Gaza for their own use so unfortunately there are many uh, people who deserve the blame <laughs> I missed your second question but can you remind me the second question um, what was the second question the elections the uh, elections. elections yeah well but I wasn't clear I think it wasn't clear on the mean, question yeah. though yeah so the question is there is no, like the, the Palestinian elections you're talking about, or the Palestinian elections. They're not yeah. going to happen. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, look, I, I think neither party has an interest in elections. Um, there's a push. There's a lot of pressure. I mean, Abbas, I think, acknowledged last in the last couple of days that European states have wanted him to set a date for elections. They're all looking for an excuse. Abbas wants to use the excuse of Israel not allowing Palestinians in East Jerusalem to vote, which they should under international law, because they're part of the occupied Palestinian territory, as an excuse to do and it. And they can't vote in Israel, so. And they can't, well, yeah, they can't vote. I mean, yeah, yeah so. They can vote only they can vote for the municipal, municipal level. Right, they can vote yeah. at a local level, but not, not, yeah. not for the Knesset. All that is to say, I mean, I'll see it when I believe it. You know, I want to be more optimistic, but the problems of the Palestinian authorities are much more structural than just whether or not there's an election. Yep, yep. Uh, let's take the two young women over here. In, okay, so you first, and then you can give her the microphone so that she can go next. Okay. Maybe we'll take those two questions together. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, Adi, since you said you're an optimist, and that makes me so happy because we live in times things are very bleak. What what feeds your optimism? You have probably seen some of the most horrible, or had to read some of the most horrible. Uh, human rights violations, 
what are some of the things that makes you hopeful and makes you uh, optimistic about our future? Yeah, and, and you know, I want to build off on that because one of the things I wanted to ask you is, how do you do it? I mean, you know, working within clearly unjust um, systems, you know, whether it is uh, Guantanamo, Guantanamo or, or Egypt and um, Israel, Palestine, how do you balance the practical need to work within uh, these systems uh, while also not getting sort of swept into? I mean, how, how, how do you balance it? And I guess that's sort of a dimension of the question of how do you um, get that optimism? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. My name is Naid Gazul. Um, I'm a fellow uh, researcher at Columbia University. My question is a bit out of context, um, the Palestinian context. Uh, from your position as a human rights um, director, um, do you think you know the human rights violation committed by Israel is more the human rights violations committed um, in Syria? during this crisis, and I hope, I, I know you are maybe not an authority on the Syrian subject, but uh, your opinion matters a lot to me. Thank you. And I should actually, uh, Nahed is one of five uh, inaugural Mellon Fellows at the Columbia Global Center in Amman, uh, in partnership with the Mellon Foundation. Uh, we will have 25 uh, young uh, displaced scholars wow. uh, spend a one-year uh, fellowship at the center and work with a mentor um, on campus uh, back in New York. Um, so now I had this part of that inaugural class. And then, I think, is it Chala? It's you? Yes, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Chahla. Um, I've also been permanently denied entry. Um, I have uh, while you were working for the Columbia Global Center in Amman. Yeah, <laughs> I was working with Safwan. It's his fault. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, my first question is: Do you think if any kind of semi-governance, if you want to call it, on all Palestinian sides is actually dissolved, would it build a stronger case to legally um, kind of push for the Israeli side to take on the responsibility of the occupied? population, or is that more of a theoretical fight than it is something that would change on the ground? Uh, the second thing is, what can Human Rights Watch do for you in a case like this, and what's going to happen in terms of filling the role that you were forced to leave behind? Other good questions. Um, maybe I'll start, I'll work my way backwards. The optimism one's a good one to, to sort of come back to. Um, but. So starting with HR, Human Rights Watch, I mean, look, we're not going to allow any country in the world to have a veto power over who covers the country. The minute you allow Israel to effectively, you know, re replace me, Russia, Turkey, I mean, every country will follow the exact same script. So um, principally, and Human Rights Watch has stood by me. I mean, you mentioned Ken Roth coming. I mean, in court, Human Rights Watch says we stand by every word that Omar said, because ultimately this is about me doing my job promoting our research and advocacy recommendations. So look, we're continuing to challenge that decision. We have a request in front of the Supreme Court to rehear the case in front of an expanded panel. It's a long shot. Um, we're going to keep looking for ways for me to get access on the ground, but ultimately we're going to keep covering the same issues with the same intensity and with the same vigor. If the Israeli government thought they could muzzle us by deporting me, they're dead wrong. And in fact, we're only going to redouble our effort. And we made that point by c releasing that report a couple of weeks after, my, uh, maybe a month after, three weeks after my deportation. We're going to keep doing the work and we're going to keep using the same tools. The minute we allow a country to sort of uh, change our agenda, we become just any other political actor. So we're going to keep fighting for our ability to have access on the ground, but more importantly, to safeguard what's left of the space for Israeli, Palestinian, and other international advocates. And we're going to keep doing our work um, whether we're there or not. So, I mean, Omar is, just for clarity, yeah. he, he continues to be the Israel-Palestine director working out of Amman for the time being. Unfortunately, we have too much experience working in places like you know, um, government-controlled Syria, Saudi Arabia, North Korea, where we don't have access, but we still find a way to do do our work and conduct advocacy. So we'll keep doing that. We have local staff that remain in place on the ground. Um, Human Rights Watch has a team of emergency researchers that we sometimes dispatch to support our work elsewhere. We'll continue to use them under my 
direction and supervision. On the, on the first question, it's a good one, right? And I, I, as a human rights person, I don't have a good answer for you, right? Um, Israel is obligated regardless of the nature of the political authority in the West Bank and Gaza. It's an occupier. It must provide for the occupied population. It's used the existence of the PA and, you know, frankly, the system of humanitarian organizations to, to, to pay the cost effectively if it's occupation. It, it, it extracts significant economic benefit, you know, from the West Bank. Gaza. We just saw the Leviathan gas field come online, but not to mention quarries, etc., without really having to pay a cost, and obviously not to mention settler population. So it's, you know, I would be just speculating about whether or not dissolving the PA would change the Israeli government calculus. Certainly it's something the Israeli government is worried about. That's been very clear from their public statements. Despite what we see in the news about, you know, discord between the PA and Israel, the reality is security coordination between the army and the PA continues. Ha nearly, the, the report you mentioned, two authorities, one way, zero dissent, right. nearly half the cases of people detained by the PA that we documented were also detained by the Israeli ar army, often on the same evidence. So, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a tactical political question that I can't answer, but what I can tell you is effectively, the PA has become a municipal, you know, I mean, not having more than municipal powers, you know, in effect. Um, Syria. Look, Syria, look, I, I don't cover Syria for Human Rights Watch. Uh, my fiance and also my colleague at Human Rights Watch, who's in the front row, is our Syria researcher here, so you can direct questions to her um, after that about exactly. Syria. We also don't engage in general in comparisons. Um, when it comes to one country's human rights abuses over the other. Um, what I can say is that we've documented war crimes and crimes against humanity of a very serious nature committed by not only the Assad regime, but obviously by the opposition. And, and frankly, if you were to ask me, would I rather be detained by the Israeli army or the Assad regime? I'd rather be detained by the Israeli army than the Assad regime. So, I mean, you know, but that's, that's, that's not a comparison of anything else other than to point, put one data point out there. But, um, you know, I encourage you to, to seek my colleague uh, about that. Um, and in terms of the question about optimism and, um, you know, fighting in unjust systems, I think you have to be an optimist to be a human rights defender. I mean, how else do you wake up every morning and go to work and work on the same things if you feel like, you know, that you can't have an impact and to make a difference? Um, part of, you know, the way that I personally have, have done things, when I'm working on something, there's nothing more important in the world to me than that fight, right? When I was in Egypt post-coup documenting mass killings of protesters, you know, for me, it was very personal that we told the story to the world. And, and you can say, look, nothing's changed. The, you know, the CC government has doubled down in Egypt. Um, you, my work in Guantanamo, my two clients themselves ultimately were released, but, you know, there's still 41 men that are detained in the prison. You can always look at things with a pessimistic reading, but I think, um, you know, not to sort of go into a... Uh, yeah, uh, uh, saying, but you know, the arc of justice, uh, I think, often bends in the right direction, and it takes persistence. I think Mandela wrote in in his autobiography that it always seems impossible until it's done. So for me, I try and take the smaller victories. Right when I look back at Egypt, I say, well, you know, there's not been accountability for the Rabah massacre. Right. Certainly, the Sisi government is empowered, but you know, the world understands this. I think now is one of the world's largest single-day killings of protesters on the scale of Tiananmen. Right? Right? And, you know, the Egyptian government, every time there are protests, lives in fear of the people and what, what they can do. In Guantanamo, you know, I think we were able to, to, to create a reality that even this lawless U.S. administration is afraid to put new detainees, you know, in that prison. When it comes to Israel-Palestine, I take hope from some of what I mentioned earlier. I think there really is uh, a old, courageous collection of human rights defenders that are on the ground, that are pushing new frontiers. I do think there is a movement on the ground. Um, uh, some of the Israeli friends of mine, Palestinian friends of mine, um, are really see things similarly, are pushing lines, are, are articulating a universal vision. I, and I go around the world talking about these issues, and I see public opinion shifting in places, um, in, in the United States, it in is. Europe. It's, again, not manifesting itself in shifting policies, but there are important changes, right? And I think the Israeli government, the U.S. government, um, in, in some ways, their sort of 
uh, declarations around settlements in Jerusalem have only consolidated the international consensus in the other direction on refugees keep going down the list and I think the world is starting to understand this for what it is right it is a deeply discriminatory uh, regime that's in place on the ground and, and that reality the clarity of it is becoming more and more obvious now it, it's not going to change overnight and it's not inevitable history is never inev inevitable but I, I see people fighting I see some shifts in public opinion, and I genuinely believe in my heart that there will be a day in which human rights and equality and justice is respected there, and I believe I'll be back one day too. And many of you in the room who can't go, I know a lot of you are here living in Jordan, in part because you can't be uh, the Palestinians in the audience, etc., because you can't be there. And I, I do believe we'll see a day where that reality changes. You know, Omar, you know what, gives me, what makes me optimistic and hopeful? You. <laughs> You really do. <laughs> you, you and people like uh, Sarah and Sarah Lee and Ken and all of those like you who have dedicated your lives and your energies and your intelligence and your passions and your hearts to working uh, on advancing human rights. Because as Mandela said also, you deprive us of human rights, you deprive us of humanity. So how can you not be optimistic and not be hopeful? The only way not to be is when you give up on humanity altogether. Omar, yani, not only thank you for this incredible conversation and for being here with us today, but really thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you.